technology, um, uh, Sadhguru, because, I mean, we'll come back to the earlier point. I'm sure you said it. I tried to re-say it and it wasn't good. But uh, again, in COVID, people were wedded to their phones and devices. Many classes happened online, I think even in, you know, uh, schools. Now, my question is, what is the connection between technology and consciousness? I mean, people are on the one hand uh, looking forward to AI, more and more AI, artificial intelligence. And uh, other people are saying, once you call it artificial, it's not intelligence, because intelligence is not artificial. No, inter I would once again correct this. They must make it artificial intellect. Not intelligence. It is not intelligence, it's intellect. Because data, processing of the data. I will tell you my encounter with artificial intelligence <laughs> Well, I've been invited to a lot of these artificial intelligence conferences in the last couple of years. So I always ask them, why me? Because I'm… I'm not artificial intelligence in any way, nor am I a technology guy. They say, no Sadhguru, we are all worried that our jobs will go away. You're the only one who seems to be going around <laughs> without a care in the world <laughs> I said, see, always it's… people have been asking me, Sadhguru, what's your ultimate dream? I said, if I become unemployed, that will be the greatest thing. Because my work is to ensure that everybody lives to their full potential. If that happens and I'm unemployed tomorrow, fantastic <laughs> I'll do something simple. The whole planet will be conscious. <laughs> yes. So, that's not an issue for me. You guys are worried about this because you… See, there was a time there were religious people who just read one book and acted like they were agents of God. Now, I'm sorry, I'm not… no insult, okay, with all due respect. Now there are universities and professors, school teachers, everybody, they read ten books or hundred books or whatever. Now they're acting like they're agents of whatever, ultimate intelligence. Now my phone has… knows more than my professor, ten times more, not just more. If I… in, a, in another two years, you will see my phone will be capable of doing ten PhDs in a year, any subject, any subject. You understand? So, I am saying, when you read one book and act like agent of God, when you read ten books and acted like you came dropped from somewhere else, this has always been irritating me from my childhood. Huh. I am so very happy that you guys are all getting ex extinct. Obsolete. <laughs> extinct. <laughs> Extinction will happen in fifty hundred years time. Teachers will go pfft. There will be no teachers. Mm. Only facilitators will be valuable. Mm. Because even today, see, grandparents have gone out of vogue. Why? Because they sat at home, die and nada. You won't understand Tamil. I do, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, some accumulated memory, which they have turned into. I'm not trying to belittle this. They essentially accumulated memory. A child is interested in all this because he's just come, he's fresh. Surely. Here, he's a new guy. This guy has been there for eighty years. Now, every little thing, he makes it like it's something superhuman, you know what happened, this happened, I know this, I know that, I know that. He may not be in actually intending, but that's how it comes out. The child sits there in awe. Oh, yeah. Nobody is sitting in front of the grandparents anymore because the Google lady is there. <laughs> she knows more than your grandmother, for sure. <laughs> and these days, your grandmother also is consulting her <laughs> So I am saying, holding little bits of accumulated information, you are acting big. Mm. That age is over. When it will be fully over is just a question of how quickly you will develop technologies. Information like this means it will come, maybe even you won't need a phone. Mm. In another twenty-five years, you don't have to carry an instrument, not even spectacles. It's possible you can just have an implant. Correct. Even in your hand, you can have it and say like this, it will tell you what you want. What you think, you ask a question not even loudly. You s look at this mountain and say, what's the name of this mountain? It's a Wellingiri Mountains. This, 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 this is altitude, this, 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 everything. So when this happens, why do I need my geography teacher? Similarly for every other subject, you know. 
So what will become important is people who have perceived something in that subject. See, there is room for perception, that's what great scientists became. Because they did not… they did not just say what they studied in their college. They observed some other phenomena which had never been observed, maybe something as simple as an apple falling down. But even a village boy knows an apple falls only… only the down. Even a, your grandmother knows it falls only down, nobody thought it will fly up. But just to look at the phenomena, why it falls down, well, you have an Isaac Newton, all right? A giant among scientists in many ways. Whatever, today there are disputes about it, it doesn't matter, there are disputes about everything. But just that simple observation that every village boy, when he threw the stone at the apple, he did not think it may fly up. Otherwise, he wouldn't waste his efforts, he knows it'll come only down, isn't it? But that observation with a certain context made the world of a difference, all right? Similarly, many other observations have happened. These observations did not happen because of the education that they have, accumulated information that they have. Somebody puts on a coffee kettle and the boil, it boils and lifts the lid. You have the locomotives. How many people had made coffee before that? Somebody tired of work goes and settles down into your bathtub, water overflows. Suddenly you know the volume of your body is the same amount of water that goes out, you have the loss of flotation. And today we are navigating the oceans because of that. I'm saying this has come because of attention, not because of knowledge, not because of memory. So essentially, till we understand the difference between memory and attention, but now this artificial intelligence as you call it, I would call it artificial intellect, mm -hmm. I'm waiting for it to come. Because all the people who are peddling memory and acting big, whether they were agents of God or they are uh, apostles of knowledge, they will all be wiped out. It's a good day for the world. It's a very good day for the world. Now, <clears throat> between these two things, it is very important. It will also come along with this artificial intelligence growing in terms of it's only not going to impact education, it's going to impact industry, business, everything. I estimate by let's say 2060 or 2065, 50 percent at least, probably 70 percent, at least 50 percent of the people on this planet need not work. Fantastic time, this is my dream but I don't think I'll be there, but it's my dream time. They don't have to work. How many human beings today are geared that if they have nothing to do, they will be fantastic? If I have nothing to do, I'm at my best. <laughs> Hardly anybody. So, if they have nothing to do, they will overeat, they will drink, they will drug, destroy themselves, kill each other, do all kinds of things or kill themselves. Suicide, big time. So it's very important, this is something I'm continuously talking, uh, you know, even the other day I was talking to the Hatha Yoga teachers who were going through the training. I said, this is the time, this is the cusp we have. In the next ten to twenty-five years, if you bring this dimension to people's life, they do some simple yoga, if they sit here, they can sit still and be fine. If this happens, when we have no compulsive work to do, to make a living. In America, you know, this make a living is a very American term, but it's also percolated here now. Uh, what do we do for a living? I said, I don't do anything for a living, I'm alive. Why will I do anything for a living? <laughs> I'm anyway alive. No, 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 how do you pay bills? I said, I don't make bills. Here nobody makes bills. This is the idea of living together. Nobody is worried what is the bill. Everybody does their best. Bills are paid by somebody. It's a more efficient way of living, I'm saying. <laughs> Here people don't have to bother, did I pay my electric bill, did I pay this tax, that tax, nothing. These four thousand and odd people who are living here right now, this number will multiply in the next few years. They don't pay any bills. We just made sure everybody's conscious how they use the electricity, how they use the water and everything. They live consciously and do their best to whatever work they are doing. Bill paying, there is another department. Only they bother about the bills. <laughs> now, to pay bills, you are spending a whole life. There must be a way not to produce bills. Hello? 
-hmm. So for survival, for the sake of survival, you spend your entire lifetime, you should have come as an earthworm. Unfortunately, uh, evolutionary process blessed you a little too early. <laughs> but now that this AI is coming, it's great. As I said, my first encounter with AI is like this. I was thirteen years of age. For the first time, these kids will laugh at me now, because uh, when they were in the cradle, they were messaging <laughs> their mother <laughs> But when I was thirteen years of age, for the first time, I saw a calculator. This big it was, like this and like this. Have you seen those Sony, Panasonic calculators? Sony calculator is hundred and twenty-five rupees, very expensive. Panasonic, if you go to that Bangkok bazaar, Hong Kong bazaar used to be there, I don't know why they were called those names. Anyway, if you went there, you could negotiate and get it for ninety, ninety-five rupees. So everybody had Panasonic. Suddenly it came, first time I'm looking at it, I said, what the hell does it do? They said, look at this, tuk, 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 tuk. 1675 into 346, how much? Talk. <laughs> I felt very insulted. When there is a stupid machine which can do this, why are they harassing me in the mathematic class? <laughs> Making you learn all the tables. I said, why can't we make one machine like this for every damn subject so that I don't have to come here <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, that dream, it looks like it's going to fulfill after my time is over. But that was my dream. So it's coming true, people must be ready, academics especially, to, it'll start with them, but with industry, with business, with everything. In the next hundred years, probably only ten percent of the people will have to work to manage. Everybody, Everybody else is free, what a fantastic time! But if you're not spiritually conscious, mm. you will be the biggest disaster. Biggest disaster. See, it's already beginning. Wherever there is a certain amount of artificial intelligence coming... Depression is increasing. That is already... that's been there already for the last twenty-five years. But now, slowly they're legalizing all the drugs. Just yesterday, New York state legalized marijuana. Sixteen states have legalized. Oregon state has legalized almost everything. Hot drugs also, if you're only for your consumption, it's your problem. Only if you have beyond a certain quantity, you're peddling, so that's a problem. So, these are all... see, they may not be conscious of this. This is all response, this is what consciousness means. If you create a certain consciousness, rest out of it will just happen. Unconnected it seems, but it's all connected. You will see, drugs will get legalized everywhere, otherwise there's no way to manage the population. Population who have no need to go to work in the morning, you must drug them. Otherwise, they'll... they're a hell of a lot of trouble. Instead of sleeping for eight hours as per doctor's prescription today, they... they will sleep for sixteen hours. In remaining eight hours, they can't create much trouble. Really, that's where it'll go. A pacified see, population. See, this we have been using always. For example, if you go to a place like Morocco, you'll see a lot. In India also, some of the snake charmers used to do this. In Morocco, if you go, they'll have dozens of cobras. They will leave one of their little child, will go and roll among the cobras and do all kinds of things. Everybody is... oh, the tourists are like, bah! So I went and saw, I know enough of the cobras. It's all black, beautiful cobras out there on the street. Like in one place, one guy has got some eighteen, twenty cobras all with hoods raised. And they leave this child, the child will roll all over. Cobra does nothing, it's just like yeah. this. I just went and picked up one. That guy got angry, why are you picking up one? No, no, it'll bite you. I said, don't worry, man. I picked it up and I know the damn thing is drugged, oh, okay? They, yeah, they're feeding opium to them and they're like that. They don't even know they should bite you, <laughs> like that. So, I'm saying whenever you sense that by themselves there is no particular action needed for their survival process, then in some way you have to drug them. We have done this to communities who... who are not p participating in the modern uh, building of the world or whatever you call it, or the destruction <laughs> or the building, whatever you want to call it. All those people are always given free alcohol, that's how... Native Americans? Many tribes are managed like this, free alcohol, free drugs have been given. That is the thing that is already beginning to happen. In India also, chorus is rising already, why can't we make marijuana legal?
you make it legal in fifteen years, why can't we make cocaine legal? It'll come, Wha what's the problem? What is the problem? At least I'm not causing any harm to you, I'm just sleeping. No harm. See, if you take away all the possibilities of what a human being can be and can do, all the problems are also taken away. Is that the way to handle is the big question. Absolutely. Even religion was like a drug. Yes. You just dose people with it and… Spirituality them... still largely is being given as a drug. Here I'm giving them a steroid injection <laughs> to be super active with everything. People don't understand why so much activity. One important aspect is they must be engaged in activity, which is not survival process, which is not about their survival, but it is about somebody's well-being, the people that you do not know, it's their well-being. It's not even your loved ones or somebody, somebody that you do not know. Their well-being, you must do it like your life depends on it. This will raise you in a different level of consciousness. If you do not raise human consciousness in the next fifteen to twenty-five years' time, you're heading towards that chemical addiction time because as more and more people need not work, more and more people, their survival is taken care of. This will happen, you can see this in Japan, the number of suicides are so high this year, 2020, more people have committed suicide than the number of people that the virus killed. So you don't need virus actually, you're doing great by yourself. You could actually inform them, you guys don't come, we will do it ourselves <laughs> Sadhguru, is the time ripe for collective yoga then? See, that's the whole thing, you can't do collective yoga. You're… you're looking for a <laughs> lot of people will be with you here also. Sadhguru, can somebody else do yoga for me? Not somebody else, everyone… Everyone does, except me <laughs> No, we also want to do but, but because for I am saying this because there are now prayer outsourcing, you know. Oh, no, in India… in I'm India, they're praying for the American people. Let's say in America, somebody lost their mother. They want to do three, four days… Dial of a prayer three or four days of prayer for their mother. But of course, uh, they can't do it because uh, they have their party, they have their work, they have their whatever. So, somebody in India prays for their mother. Will that guy pray for your mother? That guy is doing it as his livelihood. Uh, he will put on a tape. It's all fine because anyway prayer is being said. Because anyway, it was only the echo. You'll get the echo. No problem with the prayer. <laughs> I'm saying, you will become ridiculous the moment you say collective yoga. I know what you're saying, that's not what you're saying, but I'm saying that is how everybody will interpret it. Transformation is always individual. There is no such thing as transforming the world because there is no world. It is just a word, it's you a dictionary word. word. Yeah. There's the only word. you and me. If you work on this and that, yes, in… The, if you… If this one and two becomes billion, then there is transformation. That also is not world's transformation, it is individual transformation has become more widespread. There has never been another time like this for that purpose. Because I want you to look back and see, many great beings have come, no question. Some of them have become famous, you hear about them. Most of them, you… their names you do not know because they came quietly impacted a few lives around them and they left. Their names are not heard anywhere, especially in this country, there are millions of beings like that, who just impacted maybe twenty-five, fifty, hundred people around them. People, those people experience them as something fantastic, nameless people, they just disappear. You will hear of a Krishna or a Rama or a Buddha or somebody like this, because they became famous. Their being famous has nothing to do with their spirituality. Somebody else also might have had the same spiritual process, but does not have the right PR, they got bad media or no media, you know. All these things are there, yes, because you are misunderstanding a social phenomena for a spiritual dimension. Like for example, I have been the same thing for the last forty years, in my way of perception, in my way of knowing, whatever I am within myself by experience, I am the same, nothing has changed. Maybe my ability to communicate has changed, but more than anything, my social situation has changed. Now you should see, I don't wish to insult any of them, but uh, including my family, I would say, 
See, they are very sensible, uh, well-intentioned, really good people, all right? But still, they were ashamed that I have become a yogi. Because I threw away my business, I threw away everything, and they don't know where I am and, uh, you know, I'm looking wild and uh, their concern is who will marry him, what will happen, what's his status in the society, all this stuff. But today they are all over. It's sometimes embarrassing, much people much older than me, my ma… my aunts and others wanting to come and touch my feet. I have known them, I have played in their lap, all right <laughs> Now they want to come and touch my feet. But forty years ago, they thought, oh, he's lost it. So even today, they don't experience me for what I am. Because I've become well known in the world, they are all impressed by that. So they're impressed by the social phenomena, I'm not trying to blame them, because that's where they are in their life. So being impressed by the social phenomena and thinking that's it, is a wrong way of looking at it. So one Buddha might have become famous, there have been many, all right? One became famous because he handled uh, social things properly. So that's not important for me. There are many and their… their knowing and their uh, whatever their experience is available to us, that's a different matter. But today, we are positioned like never before. When a Buddha came, if he spoke a gentle being that he is, maybe twenty-five people heard at a time. Today I can sit here and speak to the entire world. You know, many times I've done this just to irritate people. See, uh, like Mike Tyson. I am the greatest guru ever in the history of humanity because if I speak, the whole world can hear. All the great beings that you're talking about, if they spoke, hardly ten, twenty people heard. And they went and misinterpreted anyway. Now it's all… the cameras are all capturing everything. If you go home and say, uh, tomorrow something different from what I said, I will send you the video of Makran, that's not it. This is what I said. I'm saying the technology is a tremendous possibility. Never before this was possible that you could transform an entire generation of people. For the first time, that possibility is sitting here. But how are we using it? Technology. <laughs> when this… Uh, you know, like this is almost about thirteen, fourteen years ago, I was in United States in our office there and we were working. Then somebody said, Sadhguru, do you know every day, over hundred thousand people word, uh, type out the word spirituality online. I said, is that so? What are they looking for? What is coming up? Just l let me see. So they typed spirituality. First thing that comes up is a spa in Mexico <laughs> Yes. Second thing that comes up is a call girl in Northern California. Because she's learned the SGO, she says spiritual, this spiritual, that spiritual, whatever, she uses that word twenty-five times. If you say spiritual, she pops up, okay? So that is when I decided this is ridiculous. And then they tell me, I just contacted a few more experts in the field, they tell me seventy percent of the data online is about pornography. And uh, some phenomenal number of children below fifteen years of age are being sold online, okay? The day we started selling our children, we hit the bottom, there's no further to go. There's really no further to go. Twelve, thirteen-year-old children, you're s selling them for some dirty business, that means you've hit the bottom, isn't it? There's no further place to go. So if this is how we are going to use technology, that's when I decided we have to make sure at least there's some 4.36 billion people who have ac access to internet. I said, every one of them, in the next few years' time, they must know this much. We are right now translating everything into twenty-one languages wow. across the world. Everybody should know this much, human experience is caused from within. Mm. Your joy and misery, your pain and pleasure, your agony and ecstasy happens from within. If they know this much, whether all of them will become spiritually uh, excel in something, it doesn't matter. They know this much. My suffering and my well-being, both happens from within me, not because of somebody, not because of something. It's happening from within me. I am… I am… You know, the very seat of… the seat of my experience is within me, but I am not sitting on that seat, that is my problem. If they understand this much, my job is done with people. Sadhguru, coming back to, you know, your job as you call it, 
and uh, with what's happening with technology. Are we going to become cyborgs instead of yogis? Uh, see, that's what I said. We, the technology is, uh, has no character of its own, it's just a tool. So if I give you a knife in your hand, will you make a nice meal for me using this knife? Or will you do surgery, not for me, him? A little surgery and maybe save his life or whatever, relieve him of his pain? Or will you take the knife and try to murder me? Is the knife deciding this? Knife is not deciding this. Technology is without intent. This is why more than developing technology, transforming human beings is more important. Because the ultimate technology on this planet right now and it will always be so, is this piece of technology, what you call as the human mechanism. This technology did not come up in nine months as you think. It took millions of years from a single-celled animal… Anim, uh, amoeba to come here to this level of sophistication and complexity, it took millions of years of work. By whom? By the most intelligent force in the universe, which is constantly on. This is a living intelligence. This is the biggest problem that the religions have done, the greatest disservice that religions have done is, they said, uh, God is love. Why do I want to be loved by somebody in heaven? If I want to love, I will fall in love with somebody next door. <laughs> I'm saying, why I want to love somebody in heaven, I'm asking. You know, <laughs> this, uh, I was in conversation with uh, Shubhas guy, who was one of the Subhash directors. Yeah. So, uh, we were in conversation and then he's asking me, Sadhguru, when you were a teenager, uh, which Mumbai actress was your Favorite. love? <laughs> I said, why will I be in love with a Mumbai actress? There were enough pretty girls in Mysore city <laughs> I'm saying this kind of thing we have. If you say peace, God is peace. If you say joy, God is joy. Anything that is human quality, all the fine human qualities that we have, we've exported it to heaven. Why? Because you become incompetent. If you say dog is love, I can understand. God is love, you have no knowledge about it. Hello? Yes or no? So you are ca catching a bunch of people who have never experienced any sense of love with fellow human beings or anything else. To them, you tell them love will come from up there. They will look up and wait for the rest of their life, it's their fate. But anybody who has little sense, if he does choo-choo-choo-choo, Dog will love you immediately. <laughs> Hello? Now for a human being, you have to do little more <laughs> But they will also love you, <laughs> I'm saying <laughs> This may sound sacrilegious, but there is nothing sacrilegious about it. The real sacrilege is this, that all the wonderful qualities of a human being you have exported and now we can only import it with a license through you. This is a sacrilege, this is a crime if you ask me. This is why I've been saying people are very angry with me. I said the greatest crime that's been committed in the world by humanity is the idea of heaven. Someone telling you there is a better place than this to live is a sure way of denying people from making life good here. The moment you say there's a better place than this, if you know so well, if there are better accommodations somewhere, why don't you go first? No, I'm interested in sending you <laughs> In evolution, Sadhguru, will we also what Shurabindu called supramentalization, will that also oh, happen? Oh, now I know under whose influence you are, <laughs> supramental. No, I'm asking <laughs> in evolutionary terms, because about uh, 10,000 years ago, we couldn't think… No, no, that's not true. Uh, as, as well as we could today, perhaps. See, this is what I'm saying. Today, if you walk into the village, Let's say we take one of these boys or girls into the local village. Meet a village boy or girl who's about the same age. Suddenly these guys will start speaking in English, they look like this. Because in this country, we have this, if you can not speak English, obviously you must be dumb, okay? So all the people who lived in this country before the English people came, where they did not know this language, all of them were dumb. In fact, our history is written like that. We were all dumb 
Only after the English people came, suddenly intelligent blossomed in us and we became slaves. If we were so intelligent, we should have been ruling them, all right? So anyway, if you go to the village with these school children for what they are exposed to, their family backgrounds, and also what is the school that offers here, their exposure at a certain level. That village boy or girl may not be so. So if these guys start talking, they will look way smarter than them. It is not true. I am saying if both of them are of the same level of reasonable intellect, still these guys will look way superior because they are gathered stuff. Mm -hmm. See, right now, if you wear uh, more shiny clothes than somebody, wear little gold and go, everybody thinks you must be superior. Just because you gathered something, right? You gathered this much money and went, Everybody thinks you're superior. Similarly, you gathered a certain amount of information and went, everybody thinks you're superior. There's nothing superior about it. Yes, in a social sense, because your ability to access things may be at a higher level. In terms of function, it is true. But that function also depends where you function. I will tell you a classic example that happened. So, uh, in the dining hall at one time, all these children used to eat in the ashram dining hall. Now we've separated because of the numbers and the number of people in the ashram. We don't want the children to be exposed to everybody who comes into the ashram new. So at that time, I made a, this thing for the tribal children here, that if you attend school every day, you can eat here. If you go to school and come back in your school uniform, evening meal is with us. So that's a big attraction for them, that they get to eat with everybody and it's a proper meal which they may not be having at home. So all the tribal kids used to come and eat there. This is a few years ago. So all these… Uh, our school children who come from good homes, uh, educated homes, why should I say good or bad? Educated homes, well-to-do homes, uh, when they come to the wash place, we put a bench that they can climb the bench and wash their hands because it's beyond their reach. So that day the bench is not there, all these children have queued up. They're waiting for the bench to come. Those these tribal kids up, yeah. come, they see there's no bench, the older ones just bend down, the younger ones get on top of them, they just wash and they run. <laughs> I just washed this and I thought, this is intelligence, all right. <laughs> this is my kind of intelligence. Solution is intelligence. Correct. Creating problems and problems is not intelligence. Right now, human intellect is being used to create more and more problems. Solution is intelligence for me. <laughs> I'm saying this is the difference. But on the surface, definitely an educated person looked smarter. But if you leave them in natural conditions, you will see. True, but do you mean to say two and a half million years ago when Homo sapiens supposedly began, there's been no development of… No, no, no. You talk… See, from thou thousand years, you're going back to two and a half million. No, now they're saying it's getting crunched up. Time and space are shrinking and so conscious evolution is possible, not just natural evolution. You become like no. co-partners Let me nature. Let me tell you this. See, this whole evolutionary theory is from Charles Darwin yes. uh, about 150 years ago, just 200th birthday happened recently a few years ago, I think. But even when he was fifty or fifty-two years of age, he came up with the theory of evolution. This is by observing a few creatures around the world, which is an incredible job. I am still wanting to go to the Galapagos Island, I have not made it. I hope I'll make it before I go <laughs> It's been… I've been thinking about this since I was fourteen, fifteen years of age. So anyway, uh, Adi Yogi spoke about evolution differently. You definitely have heard about the ten avatars. Of course. What is the first one? Yeah, Matsya avatar. Matsya No, don't go there. Let's finish the fish first. At one time, the entire planet was under water. So naturally, life was fish, first avatar. Then water started receding. When water receded and new terrain came up, life modified itself, innovated itself they became amphibious. What is the second one? Kurma, Kurma. as you said. The amphibious animal, lives both in water and land. Then more land happened because withdrawal of water happened Varaha. further. Varaha. So among… they're skipping all the smaller creatures and coming to Varaha. Among the mammals, a pig is even today considered to be the grossest of the animal, most rooted in its body. It's very hard to kill a pig if you don't know this. 
See, the deer here, all the spotted deer, these tribal children, when they're going back from school, if they see one, five, ten of them, they'll gather with sticks, they'll kill it and take it home. It's okay for them, they've always lived in the forest, one, one deer they kill and take it home and eat it. It's their nourishment, it's fine. But you can't… pigs are all over the place, but they can't kill, because it's not easy to kill a pig. You have to do some terrible things to kill it, otherwise it won't die, because it's so rooted in the body. If somebody is extremely physical, then you say he is like a pig even today, isn't it? So pig represents that. So that is the varaha avatara. What is the next one? Narasimha. What does it mean? Half man, half animal. That's the next one. What is the next one? Vaman. What does it mean? A dwarfed man. This is what you're talking about two and two point five million years ago. What is the next one? Depends on how you're, you know, doing it, but… No, 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 in the tent. Parashuram. Parashuram. Parashuram means what? A full-fledged man, physically competent man, but emotionally volatile man. So volatile, all his life he spends in whatever. But his idea of justice, all right? He's not doing it for his personal purposes. His idea of justice is trying to enforce his justice. That is the thing. What is the next one? Ram. Ram. A peaceful man who will only indulge in violence when he thinks is absolutely necessary. And he is somebody who is trying to move at that time, what we called as humanity lives in this… Uh, in this country or in this subcontinent. So here he is trying to move people from simply lawless living to a lawful living. So he go, goes to extreme extents to prove that he is lawful. lawful. Though he knows what he is doing is not correct. For example, sending his wife Sita. when she is pregnant is because he wants to prove that he goes by the law. When he doesn't have people's approval, he doesn't want to remain a king. So he is trying to build a constitution, writing a constitution at that time, in his own way. So he goes through extreme amount of pain and personal suffering, but still he wants to establish the law. Then what is the next one? Krishna. So for him, constitution is established. There are just a few people who don't follow the rules. He just have to kill them. So that's what he's doing. What's the next one? Well, some say Buddha, some say Kalki. No, no, Buddha and then Kalki is supposed to come, not come yet, okay? <laughs> Let's not prepone his arrival. That's what I'm asking about <laughs> we Kalki. Will, we will come yeah. to Kalki. So Buddha, he is a peaceful man, he is a meditative man. People think he is a peaceful man. No, he is not. He is a meditative man. That means he is conscious. He is looking at how to transform human beings, not by rules, not by book, not by what is good and bad, but consciously. He is not trying to bring morality of goodness, morality of good and bad, the divine grace, this, that. He is trying to pe transform human beings by consciousness. He has come to a place where he is a godless man. Mm. He is saying everything can happen within you internally. So the next one is supposed to come who is supposed to be supra-intelligent, supra, 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 whatever, all right? Is it… the question is, whether this Ram, Krishna, this, that, everything, is it just an individual or is it an age? Is generational, not just generational, yuga, it's an yuga. age. Uh, let's not say yuga because uh, it's just another measure of time, all right? Everybody is mixed up about what, how many years is a yuga, there's so much controversy. At least we know how many days in a year now, so let's stick to <laughs> that. In a given age, this evolution is happening in the humanity. So right now we have come to a place, mark my words, maybe you and me won't be there to see this, but in another fifty to seventy years' time, at least eighty percent of the people, you will not be able to convince them about heaven and one man sitting up there and managing the entire universe. Already, most of these young people, they've lost it. I lost it when I was two, three years of age, that's different. But for most other people, slowly it is retreating. Do you know there, is a, there was a time, how many of you will go to heaven means ninety percent would raise their heaven. Today, even in America, I ask… keep asking this question just for fun because there are posts… there are hoardings saying, are you going to heaven or not? Come and pray in this church, something, something, okay? So if you raise, hardly one five percent of the population will raise their hand, yes, I am going to heaven. Rest of the people, 
this one. When heaven goes away, what? So drinking, drugging, nonsense, everything you want to do it here because your Apsara, Rambay, everybody has disappeared, no? What to do? Everything should happen here. So now madness will unfold. This is why becoming conscious is vital now. If humanity has to remain sane, forget about something else, achieving something. If they have to maintain their sanity, one thing artificial intelligence taking off your need for survival. Survival is taken care of by machines and uh, everything is available, you're well fed, nothing to do and you're not conscious, this is a disaster, okay? So we have to make them conscious in tw next twenty, twenty-five years, if you don't do this, what you will see is usage of chemicals will become worldwide, widespread. Already it is, it's one of the biggest trades in the world already. But I was just, uh, you know, I was in New York City and uh, I asked a large group of people, so how many of you can sit in the evening peacefully without even a glass of wine? They said five percent of the people can do this. I doubt it. Anyway, let's say they can, but they are… <laughs> they're doing that, that is their addiction. I was… Uh, after a week or so, I was in London, a very prominent group of people. There I asked, how many of you can sit in the evening without a glass of… I'm using glass of wine as a minimum <laughs> dose, <laughs> minimum <laughs> dose. Yeah, everybody has graduated into many things. <laughs> There they say, they think about it, debate it among themselves, uh, two percent. So, it is just a question of under twenty… in this country, I'm telling you. When we were young, I remember talks in the background of the ladies talking and all that, whenever there's a wedding coming up or something, oh, we won't give our girls to that family, they drink in that house. Today, if you don't serve a drink, nobody will come to your wedding. This happened in fifty years' time. Yes or no? At least in South India still it is not so, in the North, if you don't serve a drink, nobody will come to your wedding. There was a time we will not give our girl to you, if any one person is drinking in the family, not the boy is not a drunkard, his father is drinking, so we won't give because drinking families won't have any proper culture. But now if you're not drinking, you're not cultured. So I'm saying this whole perception has changed in fifty years' time. What this means is just this, to be peaceful, you need chemicals, to be healthful, you need chemicals, to be joyful, you need chemicals. So once eighty to ninety percent of the population starts consuming chemicals, either these kind of chemicals, uh, recreational chemicals or pharmaceuticals, both wise, when this happens, the next generation that you produce will be weaker than you, worse than you. That is a crime against humanity. Always the next generation should be at least one step better than you. If it is less than you, you have dialed it back. That crime, this and the next generation may commit if we do not make them conscious.